Okay, I think that we can start. So welcome back to, um, to the Quid Ultra seminars uh, series. And it's a really particular pleasure to have uh, Lance Plesson here in person, finally. So it's the first uh, seminar that we have in this uh, blended mixed way. And uh, we hope that everything will work fine and that uh, people from remote can uh, can listen to us if there are any problems, so just um, let us know uh, uh, either with the chat or, or by um, switching on your mic. So Lance uh, is a great friend, uh, first of all, and, uh, and he, um, uh, we were very pleased that he could uh, accept our invitation to come in person. And uh, he obtained his PhD in the University of Heidelberg. <laughs> And, and then he held many different postdoctoral positions in very prestigious institutions that he continued to visit <laughs> even afterwards, uh, like the University of California, Santa Cruz, and uh, the Leiden Observatory. Then he led the um, M. Nurka Research, an M. Nurka Research Group at the Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics in Potsdam. And, uh, and finally, he returned to Heidelberg mm -hmm. as a full professor of uh, theoretical astrophysics. And um, Ralph is well known for many different uh, research topics, uh, um, but mostly for um, you know, his research on the formation of stars, both uh, in the present day and in the early universe. And uh, on the dynamics of the interstellar medium, on in general, uh, on uh, astrophysical turbulence uh, and development of numerical methods for computational astrophysics. And uh, Ralph is one of the three speakers of the Heidelberg Excellent Clusters on uh, Structures, currently holds an ERC Synergy Grant together with Sergio Molinari, who is here. <laughs> and uh, uh, the Italian representative in this uh, great uh, international enterprise and uh, other colleagues in Munich and Paris. And he received an ERC advance grant in uh, 2013. Mm -hmm. So today he will present some open questions, uh, but also will give us a, a broad introduction on the star formation through space and time. Thank you, Val. Thank you, uh, Rafaela, for this very nice introduction. Um, thank you also for the invitation to come to Rome. It is always great to be in this uh, very nice city full of history. And um, I must say, this is the first talk I have been giving in real um, to a real audience in at least a year. So I'm grateful that this has worked. It's also the first uh, talk I give with a mask. So um, if I sound muffled, just let me know. And if I suffocate, I, you will notice. So um, the idea is to uh, talk about star formation through space and time. I think this is the title that you have been um, tasked me to talk about. And I was, uh -huh. So I need to figure out how I can forward. Uh, now it works. Okay. And so I was wondering how I respond to this uh, request. And so I am splitting this presentation into two parts. I will give a overview of the current state of star formation theory, uh, starting with some phenomenology that we as theorists in terms of, of observations and measurements need to explain. Um, and then I will pick two selected examples that uh, myself and the group in Heidelberg actually are busy trying to you know, work on at the moment. And I should start with a disclaimer, these examples and also the view of star formation uh, that I present here is of course subject to personal bias. So if you hear someone else speaking about star formation, star formation theory, or interesting open puzzles, you may get a very different talk. So I think you should absolutely keep that in mind. Um, so let's get to the first part, star formation theory, and let's start with um, some 
observation effects. And I think you need to start this discussion with probably one of the most expensive pictures ever taken. This is the uh, ultra deep field taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. You take this device and try to find the best dark spot on the sky as possible where you can look through the Milky Way and uh, then you just expose for days and many days. And what you see is this, about 10,000 galaxies. And um, what you should notice is that some of these things, because the uh, universe is expanding, light is redshifted. So if you look at long and longer wavelengths, suddenly you see some tiny little specks on the sky that are galaxies at very high redshift where we see you know, the first generation of stars visible by today's telescopes. And I should say that these are not the very first generations of stars in the universe, probably the second or third or something like that. So what we can conclude from that is that in the end, star formation sets in in the universe very early, essentially once the time was ripe to form stars. Also, we notice is that star formation does not take place, you know, homogeneously distributed in the universe, but associated with galaxies. This becomes more clear if you look at this image, it is a beautiful uh, Whirlpool galaxy M51, um, where you see the grand design spiral induced in this galaxy by the interaction with the companion galaxy. I don't know, does this, does this work? Ah, it works. So um, this one gives this beautiful grand design spiral. And I would like to point you to this kind of bluish uh, emission here and this kind of reddish emission. This is emission from massive stars, either seen kind of directly or indirectly by recombination light as the uh, intense radiation dissociates the hydrogen molecule and ionizes the hydrogen atom and you see some recommendation, rec <laughs> re recombination, yes. Uh, so the things to conclude or things to take away for us as star formation theories is there is a correlation between where stars form and the large scale dynamics. You see, this is largely associated with the grand design spirals, but also notice there is some in between star formation in dispersant feathers. And um, all this is triggered by the interaction with these large galaxies. And this, you know, maybe it's normal, and I think it is certainly what we expect, but maybe if you start very naively to look into star formation theory, maybe this is not what you would expect, because in order to form a star, you have to shuffle together maybe a cubic parsec of material, whereas the diameter from here to here is dozens of kiloparsecs. So how does stellar births on very small scales know that there is some large scale ordering? That is certainly something that uh, we are interested in uh, understanding better. So this is an external galaxy. We get a beautiful overview from the outside. However, we cannot zoom in into really great details. In order to do that, we have to go to our own Milky Way. And what I show you here is the disk of the Milky Way as seen in carbon monoxide molecule. And this is a tracer for molecular hydrogen. So this is a tracer where the cold and dense gas sits out of which finally stars do form. And we can zoom into some of the more interesting regions. Down here, you see the Orion uh, molecular cloud, the two Orion, Orion molecular clouds. And superimposed on that is the constellation of Orion. You see the mighty hunter. Here is the belt. Here are the arms and the, the spear that he tries to um, use to hunt something on the sky. And this is at radio wavelengths. So just as a comparison, if you look with our normal eyes, then you would see none of these emission. So we need to look at radio at infrared wavelengths to really see the sites of star formation. 
And what I will do next is I will zoom into this region here. These are the belt stars and around the central star in the belt of the mighty warrior is the so-called Orion Nebula cluster, which is still relatively deeply embedded. So you have to go to infrared wavelengths to see something. And if you do that, then you see about a few thousand of stars, maybe worth a thousand to two thousand solar masses. Um, and there are three things to notice that are relevant for us theorists. The first one is, again, stars are associated with these molecular clouds. Stars do form in cluster, just like all star formation takes place in galaxies. Most of the star formation within the galaxies takes place also in a cluster fashion. So there is a hierarchy of scales that needs to be considered. If we look at the ages of these stars, they are roughly all the same age. And the age spread we see is roughly that of the dynamical, uh, let's say the crossing time or the freefall time of these uh, gaps. So typically we expect star formation to progress relatively fast on a dynamical time scale rather than it being a very slow process. And we also noticed that this gray haze in the background this is where the intense radiation from Theta 1 C Orionis, so the central star here, eats itself into the uh, background molecular cloud. And we see again some of the um, recombination in this kind of hazy blue stuff. We can zoom in and we see in detail how the intense radiation affects other stars young stars, forming stars in the vicinity. If you were to zoom into these objects even further, we could see protoplanetary disks being affected by these winds and radiation. So once then this feedback has blown away the natal gas, we are left over with what is called an open star cluster here, like the Pleiades, which is about a hundred million years old. So this is roughly what we as theorists need to take into account to, you know, to come up with a proper model or a theory of star formation. So how can such a theoretical approach look like? Um, I think the first thing to notice is we need to cover or include a vast range of scales. So from the galaxy at large to star clusters, to protoplanetary disks, to eventually the sun, the stars, and the planetary systems. So the mean density in the interstellar medium in the solar neighborhood is a few particles per cubic centimeter. If you compare that with the density of the air we breathe in and out, hopefully without COVID uh, <laughs> stuff, it is about 10 to the 19 particles per cubic centimeter. So a huge, huge difference. Um, but still compare it with the density of the sun, it is nothing. And if you compare it with the size scales involved, the size of a molecular cloud, so somewhere between this is a few tens of parsec, and still we need to bring this material together to um, essentially kilometer size, so millions of kilometers to the size scale of individual stars. And so it is clear that there's only one force that can do it, it's gravity. And so a model, or an understanding of star formation needs to be based on the interplay between the self gravity of the star forming gas and possible opposing agents such as gas pressure, turbulent magnetic field, radiation pressure, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a huge list. And um, I think modern star formation theory tells us that. We cannot just look at the interplay of gravity with turbulence or interplay between gravity and gas pressure or magnetic fields alone. We need to take all of this into account. It makes it a challenge, but it also makes it interesting. So it is a bit like the terrestrial ecosystem, the climate, right? Star formation takes place also in a complex ecosystem in the Milky Way, within molecular clouds, in the Milky Way, where all these processes are interconnected by complex feedback loops. So I think 
it makes sense in order to understand better where we are now. If we um, look a bit back in time and uh, discuss some of the models for star formation that had been put on the table. And as you see, um, they're typically all by looking at the competition of gravity with these processes that are listed here individually. And the first one to look at the formation of stars or the instability or the stability of interstellar gas clouds was Sir James Jeans, you know, at the turn of the last century. So what you do in such a situation is you try to make, uh, you try to assemble the relevant set of equations. In this case, we talk about hydrodynamics, so we need the continuity equation. We need the Navier-Stokes equation that gives us the time evolution of gas dynamics of a fluid element. And you need an equation of state because there is pressure involved. And so if you look at the competition between gravity and thermal pressure, gravity is then given by Poisson's equation to couple into the set of equation. This is what you, this is all you need. Then you try to linearize this equation and you look at this equation in Fourier space and you come up with a dispersion relation. And this dispersion relation here is very simple. If you neglect this part here, the source term due to self gravity, it is simply that of a sound wave. So it tells us what is the competition of a sound wave and the self gravity. And as you all know, in these dispersion relations, instability occurs when the um, frequency becomes uh, complex, then we have either exponential growth or exponential decay. And so I can convert this criterion, when does this become negative? So when does this term dominate over this term? I can express this as a critical mass, the so-called Jeans mass. And so if I have a high density, gravity typically is stronger. So this is why I have this term with minus the square root. And if I have a higher temperature, then gravity is weaker and pressure is stronger. So this provides stability. And so this is why the temperature enters with a positive exponent. So this is still one of the major criteria I use and many other people use to get a rule of the sum estimate about the instability of uh, star forming gas, whether this should occur or not. Now you could say, well, this is just one of many physical processes. And indeed we can just add additional physical processes to this discussion. So one of the first to notice, oh, I can invoke turbulence were in the 1950s and 40s already, uh, Chandra Seca and von Weizsäcker. And they argued very simply, if I have micro turbulence, so if I have turbulent motions that are not thermal but sit in some whirls and turbulent eddies in the gas, and if I can separate these motions from the large dynamics of where my system responds and reacts and gas flows in space. So if I can really do this separation, I can safely put this micro turbulence to you know the purely thermal motion. And so what I get then is an effective uh, sound speed or an effective temperature simply by doing this thing. All nice. So more turbulence provides stability in this simple picture. Problem is A, the turbulence depends on, no, I should use this one. <laughs> turbulence depends on the wave number. So this scale separation that I tried to these guys put forward does not exist. If you look at where most of the energy is contained, kinetic energy is contained in molecular clouds, it is always on the largest scales. So the very notion of microturbulence is not really valid. The second one is that <clears throat> the effective sound speed we get is highly supersonic. And that means we cannot describe it by simple laminar flow 
notions, we need to take shocks into account. We need to take into account the reaction of a fluid that um, flows in a supersonic fashion. And I come to that soon. So there are problems with these early theories. And people noticed that if all these were true, most of the molecular gas in the Milky Way should have very quickly turned itself into stars and there should be nothing left. Clearly, this is not the case. We know there's still lots of gas in the Milky Way. We know that star formation is still going on and will continue to go on for many giga years. So why is that? We need some additional progress that, or process that makes star formation inefficient in that sense. And so then in the 60s, people realized, ah, but I have magnetic fields. And I come back to how we can better understand magnetic fields, how we measure them better, how we can better understand the impact in the second part. And so this is just a picture I took from Planck. This is a work by Juan Soler, who is now, uh, who is recently joined enough uh, on the other side of the town. So I will come back to that soon. So coming back to history, it was then Mestel who realized magnetic fields do not like two things. They don't want to be squeezed together Maybe they knew about COVID restrictions <laughs> already at these times. And magnetic fields do not want to be bent. So if you want to compress field lines, they resist. If you bend field lines, they resist. If you put that into the simple um, dispersion relation I've shown you before, you realize there is a critical mass or critical mass to light ratio. Um, that invokes now um, the strength of the magnetic field and the density. And there is a critical mass to flux ratio. If you have more mass sitting on a field line, then this critical limit, magnetic fields will not prevent collapse. If you have less mass sitting on the field line, the magnetic fields can provide stability. And so this led Frank Chu to postulate what has been for a long time called the standard theory of star formation. The idea is then you have magnetic fields that prevent a blob of gas from collapsing simply because initially the mass to flux ratio was too small. Now, I need to say a bit about the ionization degree of the interstellar medium. It is not large in a molecular cloud. We have about one out of 10 million, maybe 100 million particles being ionized, charged. The rest is neutral and has no idea that there is a magnetic field. So remember only the charged particle, they gyrate around the magnetic field lines. And in order for the neutrals to know that there's a magnetic field, they need to collide with the charged particles. And this can be relatively inefficient or efficient depending on how you see it, and leads to a drift velocity. So the idea is that this collision delays knowledge of the neutral particles of the field lines. And so there's a drift, slowly the neutrals drift towards the gravitation potential there. And eventually the mass that sits on a field line exceeds the critical mass and collapse starts. And this was then the background of the Shu 1977 solution, which is in the end just one special solution of a two parameter um, set or family of solutions to this collapse problem. Um, Aunt Whitworth, Whitworth and Summers, and Richard Larson, they looked at the entire parameter range, and this has kept star formation community very busy for many years. However, there are many problems with this theory. Maybe the most severe one is that it tends to predict very slow star formation rates, much slower than what you infer now. And it cannot account for binary stars. And we know now that most of these massive stars are in binary systems. 
There are many other things. So then I would say at the turn of the you know, new millennium, around 2000 people revisited the idea of um, turbulent stuff motion theory and try to catch the essence of what turbulence can do in such a situation of a turbulent self-gravitating supersonic fluid and see what it means for stellar births. So the first thing you notice is the turbulence can play a dual role. As we've seen on large scale, maybe some notion of micro turbulence is still okay and it provides support. On small scales, however, because we have compression in shocks, it can actually trigger star formation. So it is like, like Janus, like the old uh, god. It has two heads, two faces. One looks towards support and the other one towards collapse. And there are some predictions like dynamical star formation time scale, high binary fraction, complex spatial structure of, cl uh, of, of molecular clouds, and the embedded star clusters, and so on and so forth. So let me spend a few minutes on discussing what is the essence behind um, this model of star formation. So what I plot here is um, the kinetic energy distribution in a turbulent flow. So this plots here the kinetic energy as function of the log of the wave number. So large scales are to the left, small scales are to the right. We assume that energy is inserted into the system at some large scales. Maybe it is the formation of the molecular cloud itself. Maybe it is the large scale dynamics of the galaxy. Maybe the supernova explosions that drive large scale motions. Eventually, it dissipates on some small scale. Ambipolar diffusion could be the culprit, but there are other processes. Certainly, the scale is larger than pure um, molecular viscosity. And in between, at least the classical Kolmogorov theory tells us that we have uh, on large scales eddies that are excited, they break into smaller eddies, even smaller eddies. And eventually, the size of these eddies is like the mean free path. And this is just thermal motion. And here, the energy gets dissipated. We know that. The distance between here is related to the Reynolds number. So Reynolds number is the ratio between the advection term and the dissipation term, uh, and, and the and viscos viscosity term. And what I leisurely said about eddies and smaller eddies is the idea of incompressible turbulence. If we talk about shock dominated turbulence, going back to burgers. The slope is slightly different. So the slope would not be minus three, sorry, five thirds, but minus two, which is simply the Fourier transform of shock going through a medium. And if you have a multitude of shocks on all scales, you simply get the same um, power spectrum. If you measure it, it is exactly somewhere between these two uh, slopes. So there is an interesting transition. Um, here, the kinetic energy is supersonic. So it carries much more energy, orders of magnitude more energy than what you have in thermal motion. But down here, it is close to or smaller than the thermal motion. And so where the sonic scale, um, so where this transition occurs in energy and it you know, intersects the uh, turbulent cascade, this defines a um, physical scale, the so-called sonic scale. Up here, the turbulence is supersonic, down here, it is subsonic. And if I were to paint that correctly, then the slope here should be steeper, and here it should be flatter, because here it's Kolmogorov turbulence, here it's Burgers turbulence. And indeed, this has very recently been measured by Christoph Federat and collaborators. So where do we place our astrophysical objects? So typical molecular clouds are clearly and highly in the supersonic regime. Velocity dispersions are several kilometers per second, whereas the thermal velocity dispersion is something like 0.2 kilometers per second. 
massive cloud cores where we form proto clusters are getting more and more to this uh, transition from supersonic to subsonic. And eventually, individual protostellar cores where individual stars form, the binary systems, they are typically at this transition. So if you take this into account, here we have lots of effect from turbulence. And here we can almost neglect the turbulence. And thermal support is important. So the idea to put forward is on large scales, these turbulent flows create fluctuations. And in this cartoon, some of the fluctuations start to run away and collapse in, the, in their own right, while the entire system as a whole starts to contract again under its own weight. But because um, the freefall time scale, so the runaway collapse time scale is a function of density with denser objects running away faster, Typically, the small things win and form stars faster at a faster rate than the entire thing will come. So, in this cartoon you form in the center, the first object, then in neighboring um, blobs of gas, you form others. And so, the uh, evolution continues until you form a cluster of embedded and accreting protostars. And um, if we are in a dense cluster environment, like some people here are investigating in great detail, then additional stochasticity effects come into play. We also know that n body processes can become important. So, for instance, um, here, if I blow that up, we have now three protostars that accrete and compete from mass growth from the same environment. And we know that. In n body systems, only a binary system is stable. If you have a third star or more objects, they're all unstable dynamically, and typically one is kicked out. So, in such a situation, typically the smallest object is kicked out of the situation, and only the two more massive ones remain and are able to um, accrete and gain more mass. So, this certainly has impact on the mass spectrum of star support. And it is, you know, a tricky question of which process wins, because if you put that in a disk system, um, it is not clear that the initially most massive system wins. Maybe a star that forms later, but further out in the efficient disk uh, is able to gain mass more quickly because its fit to the any momentum of the accreting material is better suited for mass flows. I'm just mentioning this, um, these are details that make this a very complex approach and um, more investigation needs to be done. Eventually, typically in the center, we have massive star forming and a star that is worth more than 10 solar masses starts to do nuclear burn very soon or very quickly. The time scale is faster than this contraction time scale, and it will provide intense UV radiation. So eventually, this light will remove the gas and star formation terminates in this very simple picture. Again, there will be streaks of um, gas maybe still making it to the center. Maybe this expansion <coughs> triggers further star formation in the outskirts of this region. But I present you a simple or the zeroth order picture. And a situation like I have just put into the cartoon is probably visible here in the Large Magellanic Cloud in NGC 602, where you have a cluster of you know, maybe 10,000 stars, a few O stars, more B stars, and you see an evacuated low density bubble of ionized gas. You see how the stellar radiation eats into the remnants of the molecular gas that is still there. You see the dust associated with the molecules. You see all these fingers that resist the stellar wind and feedback and so on and so forth. Beautiful dynamics going on, very, very complex. So I think 
the current status of star formation theory is we need to look at the competition between gravity with many physical agents. We cannot single out one individual opponent. I think all of them need to be taken into account. Maybe a bit more in this region, a bit less in some other region. That is um, the area of active research. How do different galactic environments separate themselves in this complex interplay of competing physical processes? Um, for instance, in pre stellar cores, clearly thermal pressure is important, magnetic fields. However, on the scales of molecular clouds, thermal pressure plays no role. It is all the turbulence. What is the role of, of radiative feedback? Is it internal feedback that drives the turbulence on galactic scales, or is it something else like accretion onto the galaxy? Um, I think it is clear that all of these needs to be taken into account to arrive at a proper understanding of star formation. And we are, I would say, on a good way towards this, but there's still lots, um, lots that needs to be done. So, in this context, I would now try to focus on one very, very, very specific um, problem in star formation theory and dynamics of the interstellar medium. So, one could, with this theoretical approach, address many questions, such like what regulates star formation on galactic scales? How can we explain global star formation relations? I have not touched on that, but there is a very well defined re relation between the star formation rate and the gas density on galactic scales. Where does this come from? Why does this hold at many, many different redshifts? What drives the interstellar turbulence? I try to argue at length that turbulence is essential for understanding stellar births in many different environments. But we still need to better understand where this turbulence comes from. In this context, then, how do molecular clouds, which are the sites of star formation, how do they form, how do they evolve, what disperses them, and how does the molecular cloud structure translate itself into the properties of young stars, subclustering, velocity dispersion, etc. Something where Gaia can make a huge contribution because we can now relate the kinematic and morphological structure of the clouds with the kinematic and the 3D and actually 6D uh, phase space information of, of young clusters. What determines the initial mass function in this mess? Is it just statistics? Is there one process that dominates? Again, there is a huge load of literature on just this one single question. How does this depend on metallicity? The thermodynamics is closely coupled to the metal content of the gas. I mean, Rafaela here has been working on that for, um, for many years. And um, how does this then influence the formation of the first stars in the universe where we have neither metals nor dust? What about star formation in extreme environments like globular clusters? What is the origin of the anti-correlation between sodium and oxygen? What about starburst galaxies and so on? And of course, as a theorist, we can just speculate why do we need to know, <laughs> is it really true? How do we best uh, connect it with the observations? And if we have data, what do they tell us? So I will focus on this very last part. And I want to focus again on a small subsection. I want to focus on specific measurements of magnetic fields. The question is, if you look at dust polarization, if you look at the Faraday rotation measure on the sky of the Milky Way, what do we actually see? So, I will start with this picture, which most of you have seen. Um, to me, the Planck satellite, you know, cosmic microwave background, all nice, interesting. But this is much more interesting because this is our Milky Way. This tells us something about the magnetic field structure in our Milky Way, in our cosmic color, and about the dust properties in our cosmic background. And this needs to be 
this signal dominates over the other one big time. And if you do not understand that one, this way. If you don't understand this signal, we probably have very little chance to really understand all the intricacies of cosmic microwave background radiation. Clearly not of the polarization signal. So far. So the question is, can we understand this map? And I think we cannot. And um, I'm giving this talk not to provide cool answers. I think it is much, much more interesting to um, talk about puzzles that stimulate our thought and maybe we find answers to these puzzles. So I will try to argue why I think we do not understand what you see. here. And the problem is very depressing. And this picture is the reason why we have not yet published anything in this context. So what do you see here? This is our attempt to essentially reproduce this one. This beautiful radiative transfer, I tell you in a minute how we do it. Um, we take a galaxy from a cosmological simulation. We place the observer at the sun's distance from the galactic center. This is a Milky Way analog. It is the Aurigi 6 galaxy from the Aurigi 6 uh, magnetized uh, galaxy formation suite of simulations. And this is what we get. And it looks depressing. Why does it look depressing? Because I should say this has been done with a repo, which decomposes the computation domain into Voronoi cells. And what you see here, these little signs, is exactly the Voronoi cell and the neighboring cells where the observer sits. So much of the polarization signal outside the disk comes from the immediate vicinity of the observer. If you don't have a proper analog of us within the Milky Way, we do not get basic features of this cool map right. So I try to argue that we need to better understand um, <clears throat> our neighborhood in the Milky Way in order to <laughs> essentially look at the galaxy as a whole and in order to do so, then be able to say something about the cosmic microwave. So this most distant measurement that we have of the universe relates immediately, I think was very surprising to me, to something in our cosmic background, something that is just a few parsecs, maybe a few dozen, maybe a hundred parsecs away. So how did we produce this map? Um, can I go backwards? So we use for doing so uh, Polaris, which is a radiation transfer um, tool that has been uh, worked on by Stefan Reisse, first in Kiel during his PhD and now in Heidelberg uh, during his postdoc. And he can do many things. It is probably the most sophisticated dust RT that is on the market. Other people will say the same, but I advertise. Um, mm -hmm. The Heidelberg thing. And it will soon be better. Stay tuned. There will be Mark III release soon, which can do even more cool things. Um, so it can do dust, polarized continuous transfer, it can do lines. And what is relevant for this particular aspect, it can also model Faraday rotation. And it can do that in the full Stokes formalism, and it solves the full Muller matrix for the radiative transfer. It does do that with a Monte Carlo uh, approach. It first reconstructs the interstellar radiation field of the synthetic galaxy. Then it does a second polarity sweep and it compiles what an observer would see that is inside this mock galaxy. So this is just more detail, but um, I show that because the second measurement that I want to discuss is Faraday rotation measure. So 
if you have a linear polarization, it interacts with the free electrons in the magnetic field, the uh, line of sight magnetic field, in such a way that the uh, angle of linear polarization rotates. And this rotation depends on the uh, frequency. So if you look at these at two different um, frequencies, it is better if you do that in the radio or you know, long wavelengths, then you see a difference. And this tells you something about the combination of the uh, free electrons and the line of sight magnetic field. And you can do that um, as a function of distance. And you can do that for different um, wavelengths. So this then gives rise to what is called Faraday depolarization. And there is Faraday depth where you can try to do that, you know, segmented as a step out. In the observations, this is extremely difficult to figure out where the rotation signal comes from. However, we can follow the radiative transfer and we know exactly where the contribution to the final product are coming from. So coming back to this, um, so this is the RD6 galaxy and this is not yet rotation measure, it is the dust polarization. And so we fail. And the reason we fail is that we do not have in this galaxy a local bubble. There is no high resolution super bubble that is good enough that you can place the fictitious observer in and get the right polarization and further the rotations. So these are a few words about the local bubble. So this is an estimate in the looking down in the galactic plane, so X and Y. This is in the C direction uh, cut in the X direction, and this is the same. So I just show you one. This is from, from Pilgrim's paper. These are just, you know, three dimension, three cuts to give you an idea about three dimensional structure of the local bubble. There's indeed lots of recent interest in that by Marta Alves, um, the French guys, Marichal and Miguel Duchesne, Krause and Hardcastle and many others. So what these guys did, they then looked at what is the uh, optical depth and what is the uh, temperature that one would see if one looks in different uh, directions. And so this is something we can try to reproduce. This is a figure of merit if we test synthetic local bubbles. So this is something we should, at least on a statistical basis, be able to reproduce. And we also need to understand, is this you know, a unique feature or how degenerate is it? Because just like we only have one universe to look at in the cosmic microwave background, we just have one local bubble. And the question is, what are the expected variations? And for that, you need to resort to numerical simulations. So, um, this is what we are doing, we have started doing. Actually, um, there is a Erasmus master student from Padua who is looking into that, uh, Efren Marconi, together with Philipp Reisel and Stefan, um, Philipp Reisel and Stefan Reisel and Philipp Kirchidis. And so we can look at very high resolution simulations from Philipp for local bubble analogs, and then try to reproduce exactly the features we have seen on the sky. So this is uh, linear polarization, that is the total distribution, and we can build up some statistics on that. And again, this is work in progress. And um, if you're interested, um, please stay tuned. But we can do more. So, so far, this was the dust polarization. So, instead of saying we have failed, I should give you one, one thing that I'm proud of that we succeeded in doing something. So, um, we can combine this with a 1D cloud cluster evolution model. 
Well, so the idea is we take a spherical cloud, we put the star cluster in, we have a realistic description of all kinds of stellar feedback, radiation, winds, supernova eventually. And so what happens is a bubble forms, it expands outwards, driven by radiation, band pressure, etc. If the feedback is strong enough, it will just sweep up the parental cloud and eventually disperse into the interstellar uh, medium. However, sometimes the feedback runs out of steam and it recollapses and forms a second generation of stars. We think this is happening, for instance, in 30 Doradus. So if you look at NGC 2070 and R136, there sits a younger star cluster in the middle of another one. And I think we can argue whether this interpretation is right or wrong, but at least it's a very valid model and this can nicely be explained with such an approach. There are some details. We can put that into cloudy and then again into Polaris to get synthetic emission of that. So what would an observer see if he looks at the sequence of these 1D models? And um, these are examples where we compare with observation of super bubbles of H2 regions. But we can now come back to our, our Rigi galaxy. We can now replace the star formation in these galaxies by these models. We know where the stars form. And more precisely, we have the chemical Schmidt relation and we put in star formation according to the local density. And then we can place about 10 different observers at 10 different positions and see what the observer would see. So we reconstruct the interstellar radiation field, we just keep the density in the free electrons in the magnetic fields from the original simulation and the rest is just reconstructed. <clears throat> so the electrons and in order for you to wake up, I have a quiz. So one of that is our mock galaxy. The other one is the Milky Way. Which one? Feedback. Have a look. I have a seat. Ventures, I guess. Not you, sir. <laughs> so, Raphael, I need to <laughs> ask you which one is the Milky Way? Uh, the, one, the one that is uh, less than the fourth, the one there above. This one? Yeah, with less factor and small scale. And this one is the Mock Galaxy. So, the rest. Who is for Rafael? <laughs> and the rest? This is practice. I learned you vote in next weekend. So, <laughs> so Rafaela is right. This is the Milky Way. Now, having said this is the Milky Way, there are many, many Milky Ways because this is the Milky Way as well. So actually the way to learn that this is the Milky Way is this part here, because there's no data. So these guys just make up the questions. And it depends very much on which statistical approach you take. So what these do, they look at 2000 and a bit um, distant sources to get the uh, Faraday rotation measure. And then they have these sidelines and then they try to do some statistical magic and reconstruct the rest. So this is the Oppermann uh, 2012. And this is the more recent Hutschenreuther and Enslin uh, map. And that is the original Aurige galaxy. So there is nothing of the small scale structure in this thing. It is all in these local structures. And we can, so in order to, to make this numerical simulation look like reality, we need to put in subgrid physics. We can do that now and we can look at the statistics. And indeed, we get the left right asymmetry. We get the up down, uh, so the galactic plane we get right. 
And most interesting, we get the power spectrum right. <clears throat> so um, the red thing is Oppermann and the green thing is the Hutschenreuter. Just note that Oppermann predicts a bit too much large scale power. Um, this is the original Aurigi galaxy. It deviates with, this is an expansion in spherical harmonics, just like what you do with the cosmic microwave background. And the original galaxy quickly runs out of resolution and you need to have the subgrid model to um, get better. No one really knows what's happening here because um, here the actual observation map runs out of, of data. So I think that is success of reconstructing something with a subgrid model that seems to work. Now, the last thing I wanted to quickly mention is um, there is more data, right? So if you look at the rotation measures in these funny units, it goes from something like minus 200 to plus 200. But we have very superb uh, 21 centimeter-ish measurements from uh, Henrik Beuter's Thor survey. So in this strip, we see a supernova remnant here, which has an inverted rotation measure. But if you stay away from that, we still get interesting results. Because these are just the numbers that Tutschenreuter and Oppenheimer and so on says. But in certain sidelines, this goes up to 4,000. So where does this come from? What, why, why just at this galactic longitude? <clears throat> So in order to do that, we can resort again back to a model. This is kind of a model of the spiral arm structure of the Milky Way. We can look at the synthetic galaxy. This is not the Aurigi galaxy, but this is one of Ron Smith's um, galaxy with external potential that steers the gas. And it is clearly not the Milky Way. It has no bar. It has four arm structures, but it has supernovae, it has magnetic shields, and so on and so forth. And we place an observer in a local bubble. And we simply look at the different side lines. So we can look at the line of sight velocity as we go through the, um, through the disk midplane. And we see <coughs> there are tangent points to the um, to the spiral arms and their non-tangent points and we can simply now look at what is the rotation measure seeking. Maybe I skip that. This is more interesting. We can reproduce these large numbers, and the reason why we can reproduce it is that the magnetic field kind of piles up at the tangent points of the spiral arm. So. We can use these rotation measurements to learn something about the position of the spiral arm. In fact, if we then look at the peak of the rotation measure, which is at a certain angle, then you look at the peak of the molecular hydrogen, the peak of the dust, they are slightly you know, shifted, and we can potentially learn something about the sequence of star formation across the spiral arm. So this is really cool. Um, Again, this is the one thing I show you that is properly published. Um, and I think that is, to me at least, a nice example of where theoretical modeling in a very complex scheme can help to interpret the observation data, also interpret very surprising data. So we were not at all expecting these large rotation measure data. We were very surprised by that. Now, one could argue that in the Oppermann map, one would not see it because the frequency range, et cetera, et cetera. But still, this came at a great surprise. And so we were very happy to be able to reproduce it, at least you know, at a fundamental level, but not in detail. In order to do that in detail, we need to have a proper model of the Milky Way. And that is something within the uh, Synergy grant we are working towards. So, uh, I'm over time, so let me conclude. From the first part, I tried to argue that star formation is very complex, multi-scale, multi-physics process. And we need a comprehensive combination of observations and theory and numerical modeling. 
I showed you one tool in part two that is helpful because relative transfer is of essence in looking at numerical models because what we see is photons and many of the photons will be observed and re-emitted, they will change the frequency. And so if you're not taking this into account, you can be actually quite misguided uh, when we look at face value at mock images. For the Planck sky and for the rotation measure sky, I think the local bubble is needed. And so there's lots of work that needs to be done to better understand it. And there are strong Faraday rotation measure values, which I think you can explain at the tangent points of spiral arms. So thank you. And I should also say thanks to many people in the group. I leave the talk. Thank you, Walter, for this um, amazing introduction and uh, and uh, I'm standing here today. Okay. So, do you have any questions here from the audience first, and then we'll uh, give some uh, chance also to people connected to ask questions? Do you have any curiosity, um, Ruggiero? Yes. Uh, well, um... When we, when we try to compare the real mean weight with the, the simulated galaxy, um, actually, your galaxy, you, you're not building a galaxy to be exactly identical to the galaxy today. So, uh, how similar do you expect uh, them to be when uh, you get your perfect model? Okay, so I think the answer is we do not know yet. It is clear that this galaxy it was built in 2014. Model for very different purposes. We just wanted to look at the interaction of the response of the interstellar medium to a spiral wave. Now, the Milky Way has an arm. It has maybe actually a unregular, irregular spiral structure. I think there's lots of current debate, which is highly interesting. So, I think this picture of the Milky Way that I've shown you is maybe not right. So there is debate on how to really connect the local arm to the rest. And um, I think there is new papers coming out by the observers who reinterpret the observation data. So our model needs to reproduce as many of these features as possible. So there is a central bar, you know, the pitch angle of the bar, et cetera, et cetera. So we are currently within the uh, EcoGuard project building a new potential for the new world. We are almost there yet, and then we run these type of simulations. And we will start with things like that. <clears throat> this way. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, ah, okay. So we will. Maybe don't worry, don't this, worry. I will move so this. We will start with things like that. This is the galactic. Um, longitude and this is along the longitude the integrated line of sight and you can see spiral arms and features and so this is i think one of the first figures of merit uh, and we need to see so if you look at the rotation curve, right the classical picture of the galactic rotation curve you know, looks like something like this and this feature here is not just repeating the rotation it is an impact of the bar, right? The bar has or induces strong non circular motions. And if you interpret it as purely circular motion, so, and this is like the radius, you get this thing. And so we can test all of these things. And so these are different figures of merit that we probably have to, that we. We we'll try to fit and adjust the parameters of the different potential components in order to reproduce this thing, and that thing, and so on. Okay. How good we will be, if you need to see, ask me again. <laughs> <laughs> so there is one um, raised hand uh, uh, from one of the attendants, Jia Tung Fu. You want to ask a question? Because Thank you. 
uh, yes. ask uh, just one simple question. So many thanks for the talk. So my question is uh, actually from your part one. Uh -huh. uh, could you please comment from a theoretical uh, point of view, what is the connection between turbulence and binary formation? Okay, so the question is, what is the connection between turbulence and binary formation? So um, if you look at the turbulent cascade, so maybe I start on, on, on um, on large molecular cloud scales, the largest mode, so a wavelength that encompasses the entire cloud can be interpreted as rotation. So if you look at older discussions of molecular cloud structures, so the Orion cloud, for instance, people say these clouds are rotating. There are papers about counter and contra rotating clouds. And now you can just take this mental image and step down the turbulent cascade and you also end up with rotation of the pre-stellar cores that form individual stars and binary systems. If there is rotation, then it is likely that um, there is a binary star, the outcome of the process. And there's a very nice review by Peter Bogenheimer already many years ago where he looked at the specific angular momentum on galactic scales, cloud scales, core scales, clump scales. And one sees that as you go down, 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 uh, the angular momentum, the specific angular momentum gets smaller. So in the solar system, most of the angular momentum sits in Jupiter, right? While most of the mass sits in the sun. And so if the situation probably had slightly had been slightly different in the um, proto uh, solar system blob of gas, maybe we would have a binary star. So also there is recent evidence that the protoplanetary disks, so in relatively late phase from ALMA, where you see spiral arms, even n equals one, so lopsided spirals and blobs and clumps so this stuff is probably a signpost of the connection of this blob of gas with the larger scale turbulent environment. So it is not that the solar system or stars form in isolation, they are continuously connected with the larger scale turbulent environment and they get to know about you know, this environment that continuously also changes its kinematic setting. And I think that influences also the binary formation, binary properties, and so on. Thanks. Any other questions or comments from uh, the remote attendants? No? Okay, so uh, anyone from here? Two, two more questions. Alessandro? I have really a naive question. Uh, okay, you know that such formation is uh, a solve of one. Complex interplay of different processes of different scales, right? Some like cluster scale. Uh, but at the same time, we also know that there are some global relations between star formation and the probability of different galaxies, and they are also valid to a large range of crashes. And so, is there any single way to link this, you know, this property from both small and large scales? That is a very good question. So I don't know, should I, maybe yeah, I have maybe a question. So the question is, how can we link large scale dynamics to small scale star formation? How can we explain the global star formation relations like the chemical Schmidt relation um, on galactic scales to the fact that stars form very local? And so I think, um, I actually think it's not fully understood the environment does play a role. There is a cascade of information that goes from galactic scales to cloud scales and eventually to stellar scales. And some of these need to be better understood. I think it works on the global scales because of statistics. You know probably that the Ken Schmidt relation, which we probably refer to, is only valid on, let's say, kilos parsec scales in the back. If you zoom into individual clouds, 
um, this relation breaks down. You see all kind of connections between molecular clouds and, and, and star clusters. So you see that they are disconnected both in space and time. And so the conclusion of the community is that you need to look at many of these star formation events that you see in different evolutionary phases in, each, in different local states of the efficiency evolution in order to get a global relation flow. So statistics is key here. That is one thing. And then we also know that in certain environments, there are deviation from the chemical transformation. The galactic center, uh, the galactic center is much below the chemical transformation because there's more shear, there's more turbulence, more magnetic fields, more cosmic ray pressure, you name it. Also, if you speak with Gensler and Tepony and others, they would say that you need to go to different relations if you go to strongly star forming galaxies, star burst galaxies. Mm -hmm. You can play with chemical Schmidt efficiency, you can play with the uh, so called alpha CO conversion factor. So, counting for the fact that you're not seeing the molecular gas that forms stars itself, but always only some trace. So, for the molecular gas, typically take CO because. Molecular hydrogen itself is a uh, symmetric molecule. It does not have dipole emission, only higher order emission that are called dipping. And so only at high temperatures is this happening. And this is typically not the case. By the same token, when we talk about star formation rate, this is again not something we observe immediately. We look at the H alpha emission, we look at the total infrared emission resort to some kind of hand waving empirical relations and outcomes somehow. All of these have variations. And so it's no wonder that you see you know, uh, variations. Maybe one last point, which is actually dear to my part to some degree, I think the chemical Schmidt relation also is not true. And <laughs> I strongly advocate one should never ever call this a chemical Schmidt law because it is certainly not a law, it's a critical relation. And the critical relation has problems. Because if you look at, let's say, chemical Schmidt type relation or the ideal type relation of individual galaxies, you see huge variations, both in the intercept, so the normalization, and the slope. And in fact, most galaxies, the relation between the molecular gas and the star formation. So, the what kind of deal that these guys have started looking at is sub -liquor. It varies from galaxy to galaxy. So, there are also many questions on that. So, um, open questions on how to relate the large scale to the small scales. But I would also put in question some of the apparently very long reactions. I don't think they're very, really very Sorry for this long <laughs> But it was an important question. So a very brief last question. Very briefly also because actually you partly explained it a bit there already very happy. I was wondering if you were uh, showing the very nice simulation that you think that it would be uh yeah, actually it's very nice uh, relation measure that that allow you to understand which is the multi-grade structure of the galaxy uh, beyond the clear frame uh, on the right side. Uh, and I was wondering how easy it is to make predictions of star formations going from uh, starting from there. But I guess in a way you already uh, answered that by saying that it's not as easy as it seems to go from large scale structure to no but if you want to add more on that, I'll Okay, so maybe very quickly, I understood your question. How can we infer these relations from simulations? In, in, in a way, uh, I mean, going from the, from, the, the, from the knowledge of the large scale structure of the galaxy at the beginning, 
from measuring the Faraday, uh, the Faraday rotation, rotation measure, how easy can we go from there to uh, at least uh, hypothesis or suppositions on the star formation and in there? I understand there's many layers there. But... So to, to start from the observations and invert the processes, I think very important. <laughs> so at the moment, we are in the process of modeling on large and small scales, trying to combine it together. And then make predictions that can be then connected to the observation. But I think what really needs to say here that this invokes subgrid models. But numerical models, how to model star formation, physical processes in the computational scheme that can influence the result. Both in cosmological simulations, the star formation properties of the illustrious and the illustrious QG models differ. Um, on our scales, the way we form stars differs from other people. It is a recipe, right? And whether this recipe is the correct one or not, is actually not so easy to determine. And if we increase this resolution, we also need to adjust our recipe because we can resolve processes that have been before it's statistically not too soft and was not necessary. So this clinical trick stuff, right? If you zoom in, it breaks down. It simply doesn't exist in the same in the simulations, right? If you have kilopascal resolution, let's say cosmological simulations, it's enough to put in the clinical trick But in such a galaxy where we resolve parsec scales, this is certainly not true. And so um, I think the answer is not easy. We want to try to do our best. And I think at the moment, this is what everyone who is honest will tell you. And there are always open questions. Stop it, let OK, so uh, thank you again, Rad. <laughs>